on behalf of Casey, I would like to welcome all of you to attend the YEGAP talk. And uh, since uh, some uh, young friends, they are not that familiar with uh, Casey, so I would like to take this opportunity to make a very brief introduction of KCS. And KC is a regional institution established in 1966. And it, it is mainly uh, composed of 27 national labor uh, chambers of commerce and industries from 25 different countries and independent economies in the Asia Pacific regions. And of course, for the case, aside from these 27 primary members, cases still have many uh, associated member and lifetime members as well. And of course, the cases, they also served as a platform to further increase and encourage the business uh, cooperations and uh, economic development in this region and even beyond the region as well. So uh, <clears throat> if we are talking about the KC, now the, com the combined population of the KC is about 2.9 billion representing almost 20% of the global total. And their GDP is about 1.8 trillion US dollars. It's about one fourth of the global total amount. And their trade volume is about 11 trillion US dollars. And it is about 29% of the global totals. So this is a very brief introduction about the cases. And I would like to also take this advantage to introduce a little bit the relations between the KC and the YEGAP. YEGAP is one of the most active councils under the umbrella of the cases. And YEGAP has the same objectives as the cases. That means to further enhance the business uh, collaborations and economic growth in this region. However, YEGAP is much more focused on the interactions of the young entrepreneurs. So YEGAP has lots of plans and uh, activities to run lining up till the end of this year. And uh, YEGAP talk is just one of such activities. Uh, YEGAP talk is expecting through the experience sharing to inspire uh, more young entrepreneurs and young friends to bring them brighter futures. That is their goal. And uh, this is a very interesting activities and uh, I hope you like it. And uh, in closing, I would like to thank you all again and welcome you to join these activities and I hope you like it and looking forward to your consistent and strong support to the YEGAP and uh, Cassie. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Lee from South Korea and today I'm a moderator of the YEGAP Talks. Especially welcome to the, the second event of the YEGAP Talks. I mentioned that YEGAP Talks is organized by the Cassie's Young Entrepreneurs Group of the Asia Pacific we call the YEGA, and it is a virtual talk show uh, devoted to the stories and experience of the young entrepreneurs in the hope of the inspiring each other and creating better future. Uh, especially when I think about today's speaker, a few keywords come into my mind. Lomedic, pioneer, organic, beauty, role model, and global. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce the speaker today, uh, Kulan Davado from Mongolia. And Kulan is a founder and CEO of the Lamo, is Mongolia's first organic skincare brand. She started the Lamo with a vision to be a leading role model, providing people that Mongolia can produce high quality product. And she will talk about her entrepreneurial journey 
including work and life, and success and fail, and dreams and visions. Also, you have any question about the Quran, about her stories, please you can ask a question in Q&A section. So Quran, and please come on to the stage uh, to the share your stories. It is your short time. Hello, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon to um, everybody all over. And thank you, Michael and David, for the introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be here um, and share my story, hoping it will um, motivate maybe one person to, to find their own journey or hoping that maybe it will inspire somebody um, to not give up and to actually keep on going. So um, regarding um, myself, um, I came to Mongolia 10 years ago. I came back after doing a, a degree in renewable energy management at Columbia University in New York. And I was working for Mongolia's first renewable energy um, company, hoping to build a wind and solar farm in the Gobi Desert. And when I came back 10 years ago, um, for the first time in my life, I started having allergies. Um, and for the first time in my life, I started having skin problems, which I never had before. And when I was actually talking to doctors, um, they were advising me that I should use um, very mild uh, products, such as when I, for example, choose my food, I should try to eat healthy. And also my skincare products, I should try to use very mild natural products. And at that time, I did not find anything in Mongolia, except maybe for one of, um, you know, the big brands. But then I was um, looking for um, products outside, I was literally you know, asking friends and family to send me products. And they did send me products from Germany, for example. And just a small bottle um, was fairly, um, you know, expensive. And when I did look at it, um, actually, for example, when I ordered one product, it had sea buckthorn in it. And Mongolia is a country which has just enormous, vast majority of resources. We are such a huge country. I mean, um, the population is just 3.6 million people, but the country size is five times bigger than Germany. And we just have this vast, vast amount of beautiful um, countryside where we have literally everything you can find. So when I saw that I needed to order sea buckthorn oil from somewhere else, that was the initial question of why don't we do that here in Mongolia? So literally it had become a passion of mine. It had become, you know, just a very personal kind of quest to figure it out. Um, and I did start to have an online course in organic skincare formulation. And I did start to do just simple products at home. Um, you know, simple bath bombs. I started making soap at home and it did turn out that I personally really loved the products. And when I gave it to friends and family, they actually really liked it as well. So I quit everything and I did um, start my own company. I was at home for one year. So my story is kind of like a typical starting from the kitchen story because I was actually doing the skincare products in my own kitchen and I was at home for almost a year and then I launched my company I started to have one and two people uh, we launched three products and then we were in the media and it was quite fascinating because at that time Mongolia was heavily focused on large-scale product projects so heavily focused on mining heavily focused on just very very huge uh, projects and a lot of people were questioning me about you know just this whole fact that I actually studied at an Ivy League school, I came back to work for a big company and then I started making soap at home. So a lot of people did not take it quite serious. They thought um, I was just having some kind of random phase. Um, many of the people did not really believe in it um, just because obviously, you know, there was nothing like that before. Um, and it was very funny because we did just simple products like lip balm, 
um, and bath bomb, but then it was Mongolia's first ever, the bomb, Mongolia's first ever bath bomb. And even abroad, it was a very interesting product because even though we did not invent the bath bomb or not invent the lip bomb, just because we were using very unique Mongolian raw, raw materials such as Mongolian rock salt, um, sea buckthorn oil, we used sheep's tail fat oil, which is a traditional oil used in the countryside um, and put it into modern forms. So literally when I started, it was just kind of the simple trying to, um, you know, come up with solutions for my own skin problem. But then it really turned into, I can do so much more through the products. Actually, I can create a Mongolian brand that can be, um, you know, recognized abroad. I can create social impact. I can create, you know, social change, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah, I've not, I've not looked back ever since. It's been eight years. Um, and what I started in the kitchen at home with three products turned now into something fairly sustainable. Um, we now have more than 30 people. We produce more than 70 products, literally everything from um, foot care to body care to hair care, face care. And we're now getting into lifestyle products. Um, we did before COVID export to nine countries um, and we were, you know, featured on Forbes, NHK World, Harper's Bazaar, um, Asia News Channel, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think the greater vision um, had become to really create a, a brand that promotes sustainability, that promotes health, and also that promotes uh, social impact um, and, and change making. So I think, um, entrepreneurship has really given me, um, you know, this amazing opportunity to share with the world, first of all, my life values and vision, but also even if you're a young person and you're just literally in your office in Mongolia, um, actually there's so much that you can do with your product. So when we now get reviews um, let's say from the US that um, one of our products helped a child's skin become better or we get reviews from um, you know somebody that had burned themselves and after using our oil the skin got much better it just really um, gives us so much more um, to life you know it, it, it really gives meaning so I think um, the journey itself had been quite difficult because um, doing business in Mongolia is quite tough. Um, but then on the other hand, because we are a developing country and because actually we can reach so many people in this world, um, it has been such a phenomenal journey. And I think I would, I would not change it for anything, literally. And I think uh, we do have a small video um, to show that really kind of shows what we do. So, Meek, if you're kind enough to share the video. Lamour is committed to making a positive social change in Mongolia and around the world with every step of our way, starting from the raw materials we use and where we source them to the employment of the marginalized and giving back to the communities and the environment. The world is changing fast. They say, be the change that you want to see. We could sit there and wait for others to come and fix our problems, but we live on the same earth and have the same 24 hours. So why not start ourselves? We, as the young people, want to create a world we want to live in and our future generations. By doing it ourselves, we want to empower others that they can do it too. Love yourself, love others, and love the environment. L'Amour was established in 2014 at home from the kitchen with the dream to create a Mongolian brand that provides healthy, high-quality natural skincare products. 
What started out as one person's dream turned quickly into something much greater, something that would inspire the youth and fix people's skin problems as well. Something that was scalable and that people started to share all around the world, as you can see with our distributors who have become entrepreneurs themselves. From Hong Kong, Taiwan, all the way to India, Thailand and Canada, sharing our philosophy. L'Amour's vision is to be a change maker, to create a more sustainable future for our next generation. We give value to people by providing natural products through zero waste production that are freshly handmade like warm bread in the morning with unique Mongolian ingredients for the health conscious person who wants to create social impact through a purchase. Love yourself. Love others. And love the environment. So, could you finish finished your stories or had more? Yes, we can get into um, your question, Michael. Yeah, anyway, thank you so much uh, for your passions and we know how to start your own business. You know, all the stories of success business, they start the business from the garage in USA. But in Mongolia, if you want to start successful business, you must start from the kitchen, right? So <laughs> here is a five yeah, questions, okay? We want to know your journey more and more. So it's not a difficult one. So first one, when you first want to start your business, you also mentioned that because you, you know, studied the USA, you got a good degree, or so you work for the you know lots of companies. And so, how could you persuade your the families, your friends, other people to start the business? So, is there any other difficulties or challenge when I dream and start your business? Yes, I mean it was it was quite tough um, to be honest because when I first started, um, I mean eight years ago we didn't even have this talk about entrepreneurship right i didn't i didn't even know myself that i'm an entrepreneur i just wanted to fix my own skin problems but then once i kind of told my my friends for example that i want to do lip balm and soap etc they didn't really understand it because they could see just the, the 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 small product they said lip balm like why would you do that and how come and it's not even going to be successful and a lot of actually successful business people, they said it's not going to be successful just because, as I mentioned, a lot of the, the mindset was towards large corporations working like it being successful meant working for a large corporation, for example, and having a good salary. So it was very, very challenging to kind of persuade people. On the other hand, also because organic skincare, I mean, even nowadays is, is quite um, is, is quite a new thing for a lot of people. Um, I mean, our customers are just phenomenal because they have this eco-friendly lifestyle, but then still all over the world, not many people understand this this reason or or why there should be organic skincare. So um, having that said, it was quite difficult because first of all, nobody understood. Second of all, nobody really accepted. And then third of all, nobody really kind of um, like got it because they didn't understand that there was a greater vision. So they just saw like, you know, the surface of it. And when I first started, I had a lot of, um, you know, challenges because, for example, um, when I launched my company in June, I was still home. Um, in September 1st, for example, I started having like a small office. We were three people. And just 10 days after my very first office ever in my whole life, um, everything was robbed, like 
my office was empty. So when I came back, my laptop was not there anymore. And I had all my formulation. I had all my business plan. I had literally everything there. I had 10,000 pictures there, which, um, you know, at that time I wasn't really experienced enough. I did not upload you know, to any kind of Google Drive or anything. So I literally lost everything. Um, in 2016, for example, we had flooding. Um, and because at that time, my production was like in the B1 level, it was water until the knees and my, my salt and my packaging, everything was flooding around. Um, and, and it was just quite tough, you know. And every time I just felt that okay, I should stop. It doesn't make sense. I'm not going anywhere. But I think once I kind of realized I had my first customer and then I had my actual first like real employee, um, I understood it doesn't matter if people understand it or not. It only matters that I understand it and that I believe in it and that my employees and my um, customers believe in it. So that was kind of, you know, um, a very difficult phase that I have to go through. But yeah, it really helped me uh, overcome all the challenges. Yeah, I, because every day startup, this entrepreneur, you know, especially in the first days, you know, there's a lot, a lot of problems and barriers that come out, especially you mentioned about nobody understand, nobody accept also. I think it's very difficult, especially your friends or family. I suppose we expect them to understand you. So you mentioned that you just break through all the difficulties in the first day. You also mentioned the robberies and flooding, everything. So when you feel totally there is no hope, I don't know exactly how they're feeling you because when I started, robbery, hold your information, your letter. And then also you got the new one and then you got flooding in your new office. At that time, how do you feel that? And then how do you trying to, you know, motivate or encourage yourself to take another step? So how to do it? Do you have any magic word and other things? <laughs> so I think um, this eight year of entrepreneurship journey um, has really changed me as a person a lot because eight years ago, I kind of, um, you know, every time there was even just a small problem, I felt very overloaded because, as I mentioned, because we're the first organic skincare, I can never ask and like there's nobody I can ask. Um, so everything we did, we were kind of always in the front and we had to pave the way ourselves. We had to kind of just, you know, dig, dig the hole ourselves. Um, and in the beginning, I used to feel very overwhelmed. I used to feel very confused. And every time there was a small problem, I kind of felt very like a victim, you know, like, oh, it's it's the government's fault. It's this person's fault. It's that person's fault. And then once I came clear that I need to figure out my vision, and once I had that vision, which was around two, three years after um, I started at Lamour, the vision became very clear. Once the vision was very clear, I literally stopped, um, you know, feeling difficulties. Because every time I had a challenge or a problem, I told myself it's a lesson that I need to learn and overcome, and I need to find a solution today. So that I can be on the right track for my vision. So I think this whole idea of having a clear vision really um, makes you, you know, focus on the goal. It makes you very determined and it also helps you actually not feeling so confused and overwhelmed and, and, and like a victim anymore, you know? So once I kind of understood that, and as I mentioned, obviously, the, the customer and the team is super important. Um, that day when that flooding happened, um, my team was very, very kind of, they looked to me and they were like very cautious. They, 
they, they were looking at me and and wondering how I would react, whether I'm going to shout or cry or, you know, just be angry or anything. And the moment I realized that they are looking at me and, and waiting for my response, I actually very calmly just told them, okay, we need to get over it. We need to clean everything up and then try to move on. And the moment I told them very calmly, I realized everybody was very calm as well. So I think that was a big, big turning point for me as a personal kind of, you know, just for me as a person that I understood me being the founder of this company and the leader of my team, I need to be a role model to them. So I think from that moment on, I stopped stressing out about things. I just always tried to think about the solution and if there is a solution, then 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 why you know worry about it? And if there's no solution, then why worry about it either? You just need to you know move on and and try to create something that helps you you know move along the vision. So literally every time something difficult comes up, I try to step back, think about my vision, and then I try to think about the solution. You got it. I think as many people just want to see the front one, you know, urgent thing to to solve the problem. But you mentioned that you go back to the your vision and the mission. Why I started my vision. So this is very inspiring. Very, I think also it's a fundamental one. So I don't know how do you define the success. I don't know what you feel. I'm a success entrepreneur or not. But anyway, everyone has a different define what definition of meaning of the success. So how do you define? the success of your business or your life? Yes, I mean, also within the eight years, um, this question of, of success always comes up because, I mean, when you are a small, when you are an entrepreneur and you do everything yourself, things are very, very different. Once you have your first employee, you have to give salary and then things are different as well. Once you actually start to grow, things are different as well. So, you know, success, I think, just changes throughout times. Um, and for me, once I realized that the bigger the company gets, the bigger the problems get, I, I always tell people, don't rush to become big, right? I mean, everybody wants success. Everybody wants to rush and, and be successful. But then it also you know, it brings a lot of challenges to it. And the bigger it gets, the bigger your challenges become. So I have started to think about it, um, that success to me, especially with my company, just means keeping my word. So at the beginning of every year, I tell my team, you know, these are our biggest goals for this year. And I feel successful when at the end of the year, I know that I actually kept my word, that we reached those goals and that we actually are moving forward. And I think just the fact that we are moving forward, that we're still existing, still growing, not stopping since eight years in itself is already a, a great success. So I, I think success is, is kind of like a continuous thing, right? It's just a, it never stops. You don't say I stop now because I'm successful. Even your your goals get bigger, your dreams get bigger. And I think success just means being true to yourself and being true to your company and reaching your goals and, and, and doing what you said. And I think that's, that's very important for any company to really, as a team, create goals to reach them together and then be happy about it. Because, I mean, we've talked about it last year, we dreamt about it and now it's reality and we can see it and it's happening. So I think just along the way, there are just so many successes and being honest, keeping your word and being true to yourself, I think is a huge success in itself. So I, I try to tell my team always that everything we talk about in the beginning of the year, we have to make sure together that we realize it at the end of the year, because that's gonna be our internal success. So, yeah, as I mentioned, I mean, everybody always wants to be huge, but then the bigger it, your company gets, the bigger your problems get. And sometimes now when I think about the problems I had six years ago, 
it just like sometimes is so funny, you know, because at that time I used to think that's the end of the world. And now my problems are like hundred times bigger and I have to face hundred times more challenges, but it's okay because I'm learning along the way as well. I'm growing myself as a person. And as I mentioned, because, you know, as a founder, you align your personal vision with your company vision. It's also a very nice thing because as I mentioned, my brand is the representation of my values and, and my philosophies. So just seeing that happening and, and seeing through your products, you know, this impact that you're making on people's lives, I think for me personal, that's just a huge success, you know, just really just impacting one person's life in a positive way, I think for me, just makes it worthwhile living. Wow. So I think you mentioned so many good things, but I remember a couple of things. One is that you mentioned that don't lose yourself to become success quickly. Because you mentioned that when a success quickly, fast, bigger problem coming to you. And the second, you mentioned that so uh, enjoy or celebrate single small achievement and yes. uh, like a domino or when a success is small one and the next day bigger one you know larger lies and big success coming to you so another one i mentioned that you just said that impact influence one people one person life through your product through your life this is so amazing things so because your last eight years, you you know spent lots and lots of time to run your business. You also make your business success. Also, you bring your product to the global level. So, how do you keep the balance between the work and life? We always people mention that this is so important. Keep the balance, but yeah. in real life, it's not easy. So, yeah. how's your opinion? How to do it now? I mean, to be honest, I must tell you, it was not easy. It still is not easy, um, you know, and, and I think especially nowadays when, when people talk about entrepreneurship, it's becoming such a fancy thing. Um, but then real life is quite tough, right? Because starting something from scratch just takes so much um, persistence, you know, it takes so much confidence, but then, I mean, most of the times, to be honest, I don't know what I'm doing just because I've, I've, I've no one to, to look after. I've, I don't know, like, I don't have anybody to follow. So there's a lot of like internal kind of thinking, internal questioning. Sometimes I'm not even like confident about what I'm doing. And especially at the beginning, I mean, it was so tough because as I mentioned, not really, um, you know, people didn't really support um, and people were a lot questioning what I'm doing. So once people start to question you, obviously you have times of, of pitfalls where you question yourself as well. Am I doing the right thing? Is this even worth it? And at the beginning, when I, I, when I started off, I used to work 24 seven. I used to work on my birthday, <laughs> Friday night when my friends were going out, Saturday morning when they were sleeping, <laughs> Sunday night oh when, they, when they were relaxing, you know, like I was always working because I, I tried to figure it out because I didn't, I didn't know, right? And at one point um, along the way, I think it was like after three, four years, I had like very, very tough burnout and I was so mm. super stressed out, et cetera. But then again, again, coming to that moment of the flooding, um, I realized that, you know, I have to also think bigger if I really, really want to be the leader of my company and if I really want to take my vision to the next level. So what happened was, first of all, I started to realize that if I get sick, to be honest, at that time, you know, my 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 company would have stopped because in the beginning I used to be the delivery man, I used to be the technologist, I used to do the Facebook myself, and then I did you know taxes myself and everything. And I'm if I'm sick, then who's going to do that? So once I kind of realized that um, ba balance became a huge topic in my life, um, and I started to realize that first of all, 
I was giving myself goals. So for example, because I'm the chief technologist um, and I'm not a finance person, last year um, I took more like classes in finance so that I could understand like financial management. The year before, for example, I was looking into management systems, et cetera. So I started to really make sure that I grow above my company so that I can be a good leader. And on the other hand, I also made sure that I live in the moment. So what happened in the beginning was that you know, because when you're an entrepreneur, you think about your work constantly and your brain just never stops. And because I work with the States and other countries, I used to work a lot at night because of the time difference and stuff. And I still do. But now, especially after having my child, um, so she just turned three years ago. So three years ago, I, I had a baby. And then obviously as a mother and as a woman, and then as a business person and entrepreneur, you know, it, it gets really, really tough. So time management is key. Prioritizing is key. So for example, when I come to work, I um, start with the most urgent and the most important. So I try to get literally things done that are most important and most urgent early in the morning while my coffee is hot. And then I literally can move on within my mind to the next level. And then in the afternoon, I try to do things that are not that urgent, but important. So more of the strategic thinking, more of the brainstorming, etc. And once I kind of go home now, I try to be really at home. So I don't work. I, I, I don't continue my work. So what I do is now I try to be as efficient as possible while I'm working and while I'm at the office. So I don't procrastinate. Well, I try not to. Um, I try not to, you know, do random other things while I'm at work. And then once I finish everything, that's important. I go home and I try not to worry about work because obviously now we're eight years. Um, Lamor, Mongolia, especially, is working without me. So I don't have to, you know, deal with the day to day operations. Um, I created a system so that I can be more of the visionary person and that I don't have to think about the day to day things. So, creating a system uh, along the way, especially when you're around year four, five. I think is key because when I was reading um, the Forbes reasons of why nine out of 10 um, startups fail was mostly because a lot of the founders, they still try to, you know, do everything themselves. So they still try to do the operations. They still try to even, you know, do the smaller things. And what I now do is I, I really you know, try to grow my team from within so that I can trust them and they can also be independent. They can grow and make their decisions so that I don't have to be, um, you know, literally there every single day working on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think this entrepreneurial journey in itself, you know, is unique to every story, but the process is not that unique. So once you kind of realize in the beginning, you are lonely and you are overwhelmed, but that's okay because every entrepreneur goes through kind of the similar phase. And then next, you have to think about management and company culture and system. And once you are there kind of five years, obviously it means you, you have a good service or product. And then it means you have to create a system that can go on without the founder. So I, I try to read a lot about success and fail, failure stories of, of international um, entrepreneurs as well. And I try to quickly, you know, do that and execute and realize that within my company so that I don't make the mistakes. So currently um, it has been much more easier for me to balance my life, to spend time with my family because in my mind, I make sure I'm very efficient. I delegate, I, you know, I, I grow my team so they can make independent decisions and I can, you know, just balance and check. So I think it's also very important as a founder to grow together with your company um, and to make sure that you are one step ahead so that you can lead your company and not be like an employee 
every day. So I think that has been key uh, for me to, to really start uh, balancing my life and also this concept of being in the moment. So again, as I mentioned, if I'm at work, especially as a mother, I don't try to worry about what my child is doing and, and, and how is she or whatever. And if I'm at home, I try not to worry about my work. And ever since I kind of learned to do that, to be honest, I feel so much more peaceful and I feel so much more better. Okay, thank you so much. Before asking the last question, so if you have any questions to audience, we can leave the message in the Q&A section one. So we already currently got the two questions from the audience. If you have more questions, please leave the message in there. Okay, this is an official last question. Because you run the business more than eight years, you had a tough decision to start your business, take a new you know, journey. So what kinds of advice you wanna give someone thinking become entrepreneur or think about next step in their own career? Yes, so lately, um, lately I've been thinking that, um, you know, entrepreneurial mindset just in general is very important nowadays in this world because it just kind of means thinking out of the box, you know, trying to create innovative solutions, right? So not just like creating a company, but also just having this entrepreneurial mindset in your daily life. I think would really help in even trying to come up with solutions. So nowadays, even big companies, big corporations, they're having an entrepreneurial, um, you know, section within their own company. So lately, so yesterday, even I had a lecture um, for, for, for young kids. And especially with the social media nowadays, you know, what I tend to tell people is just create your own story. And Think about who you are, make sure you understand who you are and make sure you're true to yourself. Um, if you really, really want to start something, then just go ahead and start it because you're, I mean, you can be a corporate person anytime in your life, but then maybe if you don't start, then, then you're going to have this regret forever. And if you don't want to start and if everybody else is doing something, then don't feel the need to copy them as well. Um, it's very, very important to be just true to yourself and to be honest. And once you find yourself and you know what you want and who you are, then not be afraid to show it to the world. Um, if I would have listened to those people eight years ago that told me there can never be, you know, a successful organic skincare brand out of Mongolia, and if I would have believed them instead of believing myself, then, you know, we wouldn't have things that we have. And just the fact that we were on Amazon, um, as in, we were accepted on Amazon as an official brand, we were featured on Forbes, you know, and we didn't even, within the eight years, we never paid for PR or marketing or even asked them to write about us. So they did a documentary about us on NHK World. They did a documentary about us in Singapore um, Asia News Channel. They did a documentary about us in German Deutsche Welle. Um, just because we kept true to ourselves. And that's why I like to tell every single person, no matter who you are, be true to yourself. Try to find your inner values and really live them to the fullest and be not afraid to show it. Okay, thank you so much for your comment and advice. We have currently three questions. And the first one, is there anything you regret and would you like to change in your eight years entrepreneur's journey? <laughs> because you have the many, many decisions every single second. Yes, I mean, Regrets, of course. I, I, I mean, yeah. I did so many. I did so many. Um, like, you know, it's not that I always make good decisions, right? I did so many bad decisions as well. But I think I would not change it for anything because my bad decisions even let me 
to grow and understand and to challenge myself so that tomorrow I can be a better person, right? So mm. regrets, yes, I have many, I have plenty of regrets, but <laughs> I wouldn't change it for anything in this world because it made me who I am and it helped me. I mean, even my bad decisions, they helped me grow, become uh, a better leader for my team, for my country, you know? So yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to change anything. <laughs> okay. But it led to that question because you are the CEO or you mentioned that as a human being, as a CEO, you do some mistake. So one personal question, if you do mistake to your staff or employee, could you talk to them directly, say sorry? Because in Korean culture, as a senior level, you are the manager level, even though you are something wrong, so difficult to say, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, is that it is my mistake. So how about your one? How about the Mongolian culture? Yes, I. so I believe that even in Mongolia, we are a non-typical company because um i mean i'm the kind of i'm the kind of ceo i always ask my team what do you want and so mm -hmm. other businessmen they always tell me you're not a business person like why do you keep on asking your employees like you should just you know tell them and delegate them but i tell them always i believe that work is so essential for adults because you spend most of your life um, at work, right? So it's your second home. It's your second family. And I am the type of founder, for example, I never get mad at people. I ask them, why did you do certain things? And then, you know, usually they think I will scream at them, but then I never do because, you know, <laughs> that's what they think of other uh, founders and CEOs that are older, for example. And I want to have a company culture that's very transparent, that's very open, that's very honest, just like my brand, you know? Um, and I think that's why, for example, my very first staff, they're still with me. So my very two first employees, almost three, they have been with me since eight years. And I think that's a huge success for a startup um, or, or for any company, because obviously lately HR has been such a big problem, right? So I, what I, try, I, what I always tell is within my company, there's no, no one is above. So even the cleaning lady has the same value as me, the CEO. And I treat my employees with respect and I want them to treat each other with, with respect. And I want them to feel that when they work, they feel like they're doing something valuable with their life. They go home and maybe they have work stress. That's fine. I mean, every work in this world has work stress. But I don't want to, I, 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 they should never feel personal stress from work. They should feel as if they, they've done something, as if they've accomplished something. They go home, they tell their families, look, our, our company, for example, was featured on Forbes, you know, and they should be proud of it. And I think that's why for me, for example, I am able to say I'm sorry. And many times I tell them, for example, during COVID, right, when we had the national lockdown, we had a group chat, like an online video chat, and I told them, honestly, guys, I'm scared like you guys, and I have no idea what's going to happen, but mm -hmm. we are one team, and we are one company, and we are one family, so we just stick to each other, and then, you know, we try to figure out together. And once, every time I tell them this very honestly, they, you know, they, they, they literally, like, I think they give me this respect back. And they also have this like honest approach. So um, I tell my employees, you can do mistakes once, but just learn from it and don't try to do it twice. Um, so yeah, I'm a very kind of modern, modern kind of <laughs> um, CEO. Okay, okay. So I think nowadays the social media is so important for your side. How is important social media 
to aspire, inspiring young entrepreneurs, you think? Social media um, is key yeah. because okay. as an entrepreneur, mostly you don't have money, which was, yeah. I mean, with us, it was the case, you know, because big companies, they have budgets for big marketing, but then we don't have it, you know? So I think using social media is so important for every single entrepreneur in this world, because first of all, it's free. And second of all, it's so, you know, it's such a good tool to reach your customers. I mean, you know, 50 years back, you needed to pay for a TV commercial or a newspaper, but now you can reach anybody in this world just by posting a picture from your office. Um, and it's so easy, you know, so for Lamore, social media was the most important um, tool to use. And as I mentioned, when I first launched, um, I used social media, my personal social media, I used Instagram, I posted my products on Instagram, and I delivered. So um, everybody should try to use social media as much as possible. Um, nowadays, there's so much I mean, Lamor doesn't even use everything, you know, we mostly use Instagram, um, Facebook, and I use LinkedIn. Um, but now there's like TikTok and Snapchat and I don't know what. Um, so, and all these platforms are free. So everybody should use it. Um, and it's it's such a great tool to connect to the world. Okay. One people ask that because you are Lamo, your company, you have a great vision. So how could you Lamo help other young women across countries to grow their own business? Do you have any vision or do something to help the local young women? Yes, I mean, um, so from day one, we were more of a social impact um, um, and startup because even if if I didn't have money and 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 if, and we didn't have sales, we tried to do a lot of projects. So in uh, two thousand. Um, I believe it was 17, 18, we did, for example, a program called Women Entrepreneurship Day WED, where I, um, you know, I was hosting the event and we invited 300 uh, young girls and women that want to become entrepreneurs. And we had guest speakers from all over the world. And it was such a fascinating event. Then we had another um, event called Women in Business where we invited 450 women to connect to each other, network with each other, um, and just share their experiences. Um, I am also, besides Lamore, working on a lot of other projects. So I'm currently working also as a consultant for a research agency. And we, are, we for example, finished another study for the um, European Bank of Re Reconstruction and Development called Women in Business, where we did a baseline study um, in Central Asia and Caucasus regarding how the situation is for women and um, business making. And after the study was finished, for example, EBRD started mentorship programs, et cetera, et cetera. I do mentor a lot of um, a lot of girls as well. And we did a program called girls in STEM, where we try to um, help, you know, just promote STEM to girls and help girls that are interested in STEM to kind of further their hobbies. So I think just giving back to the community is very, very important. And being an entrepreneur is not easy, to be honest, like it's so tough. And I think people that have been through the journey know what it is so that's why especially having been through this eight years um you know i think it's it's so important to try and help others so that's why we have created i mean yegap talks because to really you know use social media and this digitalization to to try and impact as many people as possible so yeah, I think it's super important. Okay, thank you. So currently one the audience asked the question is that what would you consider as your major problem in running your business right now? For example, asset finance, marketing, digital transformation, management, or expand your market to the global one. So tell me one is major 
or a challenge, not problem or a challenge. Currently, you have it. So in Mongolia, the, the largest program is access to finance. Um, interest rates are very high. And in order to get a loan, you have to have very high collateral. So that has been a major um, you know, problems for a lot of entrepreneurs, and which is the same for me. So um, yeah, my biggest problem is that. So that's why I was very happy when we launched in the US and actually got investment because, um, you know, just the whole problem of access to finance has been on the, has been always there on a continuous basis. So having investment is just has been so crucial for us. So that's why we're so happy to be launching Lamor in the US actually ourselves um, and starting we're starting our work next month. Okay, because almost time is up, but I, I want to ask you the one final question. So how do you like the struggle, strike the balance between, you know, run the, your business, run your business based on according to your vision and mission, and also still listen to the customer demand or needs? Yes. Yes, I mean, that has been also a very challenging thing for us because, uh, I mean, just to give you a very kind of funny um, small story. So we are so into sustainability. We don't give plastic bags. Uh, we created five years ago, Mongolia for zero waste corner where people can come with their own packaging and bottle and get, for example, body oil refilled, facial oil refilled, and they get a discount, right? So five years ago, when we launched our first store, um, this one customer, she came in and, then she, and she bought a bunch of products and then she wanted a plastic bag and we didn't give her, like we didn't have plastic bag. And she was so mad at us. She was literally angry and furious and she was just like yelling and stuff. So it was it was quite tough. Um, but then, I mean, we, we, we stick to our vision of sustainability and we still don't have plastic bags we do give recycled paper bags and, and we started doing that. Um, I think it was like one year later, but then again, you know, the, that story. So that lady who was angry and yelling and was furious, she actually became one of our like regular customers. And within that one year, she, she kind of followed us and she, she was looking at my interviews and, and she kind of realized what we wanted to do. Um, and then it was it was it was so nice. One year later, she she came back and we started having recycled paper bags. And the um, the salesperson was okay. I'll, I will put your products in the recycled paper bag. And she said, Oh no, I don't need any bags. I stopped using bags. I'll just put it in my own bag. And then she had this um, cotton eco friendly bag. So I think this has been a, a very strong story of just being true to your vision, not trying to sell to everyone, but trying to sell to the right customers. And once I kind of realized how crucial that is, it had become much easier for our marketing and sales department as well, because we don't try to sell to every single person in this country, but we try to sell to our customer, our customer persona that we even created Within the eight years, we know who's our customer persona. So we have done the research, we have done surveys, we have done questionnaires, and now we exactly know who's our regular customer. And it has made it very easy for us to target that customer. So I think it's important to, to you know, respect your customers, to, to, to cr create something that they like, but not try to follow your customers, but make them you know, follow you and, and, and make them, you know, just want to buy your product. And I think that's very key, especially for entrepreneurs and, and, and startups. So I just want to ask my last question, I'm sorry. As an <laughs> entrepreneur, okay? So what do you want to achieve next one, really? What do you want to achieve next one? Not to follow one. Yes. What is your plan? So 
as I mentioned, I mean, besides launching new products, so we're hoping to launch new face uh, cream, which is going to be a very important product. Um, the most important thing on my mind is the successful launch in the U.S. being able to compete with the U.S. companies. So now that we've established our company in the U.S., I'm now a U.S. employer and an entrepreneur in the U.S., right? So if we can be successful in the U.S., I think, first of all, it will give so much inspiration and motivation to fellow young Mongolian, and not just Mongolian, like Asian entrepreneurs, you know? And second of all, because our manufacturing is in Mongolia, you know, being able to sell in dollars, bringing dollars to your country, and just being able to, to scale um, would mean so much for, for us here in Mongolia. So my next step is not trying to compete, you know, with Mongolian companies or whatever, but literally trying to compete with the world. So making sure that our U.S. Um, entry is going to be successful. That's my next year's goal. Okay, thank you so much. I really, I'm happy to listen to your story, especially you love yourself a lot. I think I feel it. Also, you love your employees and your customers. Also, you want to change something through your business and then you want to impact your society, also even though it's your environment. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, and hope to see you next month. So we have another big speaker coming.